double tree. Uh, right after this breakfast program concludes, we'll be right next door, uh, right in the hall next door for our business expo is sold out. So stop by, visit fellow members' parks and services on display. At 12 noon, we have our expo lunch. It's with the um, it's the annual workforce development luncheon with the uh, Lauren Jones, who is the Mass Secretary of Labor and Workforce Development. She'll be this keynote speaker. We have a great panel of speakers as well. And Louise is right over there. She'll be speaking as well at the lunch program. So we're looking forward to hearing her. There's only a handful of lunch seats left. So if you're interested in registering, make sure to see Mary Beth in the hallway um, on your way out from this breakfast program. A couple other things I want to mention. Next week, we have our ne next networking mixer. It'll be at Bridges by Epic in Andover. There'll be complimentary headshots there. Uh, a great night of networking as well. That's 5 to 7 p.m. next Thursday. Uh, October 7th, Monday, October 7th, we have our Taste of the Merrimack Valley. It'll be taking place right here at the Double Tree. We're looking forward to a great, the ultimate tasting event we're calling it. We're looking forward to a fun event. We come by, try some great food, do some great networking, bring the threat, bring your friends, bring your family, bring your coworkers. It's gonna be a great day and tickets are on sale with Mary Beth as well. Uh, last thing I want to mention is that our, in, our actually have two more things I want to mention. We have our public safety breakfast coming up on, I believe it's October 4th, yes. It's going to be held at Merrimack College in North Andover. We have the district attorney, the Essex, Essex County Sheriff, all the area police chiefs as well. This is a program you don't want to miss out on. It's something that your businesses uh, face, you personally face, and you have all the uh, experts speaking right here that morning. So we don't want to miss that for breakfast as well. And then the last thing before I turn over to Joe that I want to mention is that on, on November 16th, we have confirmed our annual dinner. The governor is the keynote speaker, so we're very excited about that as well. So a whole host of great programs we have coming up. You see all the programs on the uh, table out there in the, in the head table with Mary Beth in the hallway. But we have so many networking opportunities, so many great speaker opportunities, as well as this morning we're looking forward to as well. So to introduce our speaker, I'm going to turn it over to Joe, who's going to get the morning started. So thank you all for joining us. Morning, everyone. Yeah, morning. 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 Everyone, slow. They're slowly coming in. You know, it's, uh, I don't know what it is. Maybe it was a lot, such a nice week, and they're all coming in a little bit later and setting up right now. Uh, the Merrimack Valley Chamber of Commerce is very fortunate that we have such a tremendous speaker who's been with us for a decade at least, talking about the opportunities in the Hispanic business community and talking about how we need to work together and make things happen together. Come on in. And that's exactly what Ed Crespo does. He's been an advocate from the, from the first day I met him of working together. And he is not only recognized by our Chamber of Commerce, but by the United States Small Business Administration, which named him the Minority Business of the Year which, for the state of Massachusetts, which is a tremendous honor and it's a tremendous recognition of the work he does of bringing people together and helping us understand better where communication opportunities are, where the business connection opportunities are, where the networking opportunities are, and how we can work together. And I truly believe that we've made great progress in moving together. And our chamber membership in the Hispanic business community is growing. People like Luz and others who are advocating for us because we work together. We want to see everyone succeed. We want to make sure everyone uh, shares in the success that's available right here in the Merrimack Valley and beyond. And Ed Crespo is an example of that. And he has been a great friend. He's been a great advocate. I'd like to recognize Ed Crespo and ask him to come forward and give us a great Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you, my friend. Good morning. And by the way, happy Hispanic Heritage Month. If you didn't know, today is the beginning, 9.15 to 10.15, October 15th. So. The presentation that I have is composed of some data points. I believe that people in business rely on data. We rely on numbers for whether we're making a profit, for whether we are successful in the competitive landscape that we are in. So I will be presenting some data regarding population. Now, the Latino market, it's a complex market, like any other market segment. We all know that. So why are you celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month? President George, 
H.W. Bush proclaimed the first Hispanic Heritage Month, September the 14th of 1989. And he did that to honor the achievements of Hispanic Americans. It celebrates their accomplishments while enriching our culture and society. Their men and women have shown their contribution as innovators, as leaders, teachers, health workers, entrepreneurs, and armed forces members. In the armed forces, by the way, there is a high representation of Latinos, Latinos or Hispanics. There is some differences, but I'd rather use each one interchangeably. Latinos come from Latin America, Hispanics are in Spanish speaking. I created a quote that has been posted in national media, and some people have applauded me, and some people have said that I'm a troublemaker. <laughs> so whatever you decide, you know, it doesn't matter to me. But this is my thought. And my quote is that status quo and English only in communications no longer works in today's U.S. multicultural society. Companies, nonprofits, and institutions must be progressive and innovative to do business and understand, reach, service, and engage with the Latino and multicultural community. Why do I say that? Now, at one time, I was challenged there were about 500 people at an event at the Public Relations Society of America in Boston. And when I said that quote, you know, some people were startled, like, what is this guy trying to do? You know, somebody, somebody, uh, in the question and answer period, said this big guy, uh, he's in the back of the room, and he said to me, Mr. Crespo, he said, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to create two Americas? And I said, first of all, America is a continent, by the way. There is North America, Central America, South America. I'm also an American. I'm a Latin American U.S. citizen. And, and I said to him, have you heard of globalization? So nowadays, in the world, we need, we really need, to appreciate the different languages of the world and the different customs and traditions because we cannot, we can no longer be isolated. We can't just be the U.S., the U.S. and the U.S. because we all interdepend in the world from one another. There would be, I mean, could you imagine, just could you imagine if the, if the United States, if the economy of the U.S. would just be the U.S. and not the rest of the world? What would happen to us? There wouldn't be any U.S. Because we all interchange. Now, when you're adding the Latino contributions to the economy and society, it's a different story. So let me give you a little bit of numbers about the United States Hispanic population. What I call the Hispanic business opportunity, that's what I call it. It's a unique phenomenon, it really is a phenomenon. It has been stated by the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and many other high-level publications. While the Hispanic demographic growth is ascending, the quote-unquote white population is descending. I'm not saying that, the data shows that. According to the 2023 U.S. Census, the U.S. population had 330.6 million people, and there were 64 million Hispanics in the U.S., which is 19.4%. Now, bear in mind, Latinos continuously are being called immigrants. Am I correct? Now, unless any of you were 
descendants or are from a Native American society, I think all your ancestors were immigrants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the Statue of Liberty, right? Coming from New York. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Besides, 69.3% of all Latinos living in the U.S. are born, were born here. In my case, in my family, my wife and I, yes, we came from Ecuador, South America. But we happen to have three boys that were born in Lawrence and nine grandkids that were also born here in the U.S. So in, just in my family alone, yes, two are immigrants, and then we have 12, the nine grandkids plus the three boys, we have 12 U.S. citizens. So are, can we be called an immigrant family? My wife and I, yes. Don't call an immigrant somebody that was born in the U.S. So just kind of bear that in mind, because as you go forward in your business, don't think that everybody speaks Spanish only, or that we don't know, quote unquote, the American way. All right? That sometimes, you know, we get, we get misled, particularly by the media, by people that are not too, quote unquote, friendly with Latinos. The median age of Latinos in 2020 was 30 years of age for Latinos, while for the non-Hispanic was 41.1 years of age. The U.S. Census data shows that one in every four children in the United States, or 25.7%, of people 18 years of age or under happen to be Latino. One out of four. So you can imagine what that influence, what the influence is, not only in business, but also in politics, in sports, in society, and just about any other, any other field that you can talk about. One out of four. The city of Boston, the city of Boston alone, has over 50% Latinos in the public school system. What is a Massachusetts Hispanic data? Very briefly. There is what is called the gateway cities. Has anybody heard of the gateway cities? Okay, the gateway cities. A city like Lawrence next door, which I love Lawrence, it's only 82.3% Latinos. Only 82.3%. Chelsea, 66%. Holyoke, 53%. Springfield, 47.5%. Lynn, 42. Revere, 37. So what's what's going on? Why are what somebody calls those people. We should call it us people. Why are we here? We are here just like every other ancestor here. Mm -hmm. To pursue the American dream, uh, fleeing from persecution, whether it be a religious persecution, I mean persecution, or whether it be to just have a better life for you and your children. It still remains. Now, the big difference is called technology. See, it's called, it's called technology because when a lot of prior migrations came, they came on a boat, right? They came on a ship. And literally, they tied, you know, they I mean, to communicate with somebody in Europe, for example, you had to send a letter that would reach them maybe a month later or a month and a half later. And hopefully they would get it and then they can communicate. Right now, we can be talking to anybody anywhere in the world. We can have a nice dinner in Bogota, Colombia, or Guayaquil, Ecuador. Or the, globe, you know, the whole issue of technology has not distanced people. It has grouped people. So that's why 
when people claim, Eduardo, you are wrong. You know, with time, Latinos will be like all other immigrations, like Italians and the Irish and everybody else. Maybe so, I won't be around <laughs> to see that. But I can tell you that the Hispanic business sector in the United States of America is booming. And why is it booming? Because there is money to be made. Because a capitalistic society, which I'm part of because I own a business, works well. And it works a lot better than any other totalitarian or, or uh, socialist or Marxist type of government. I believe in democracy. And democracy means that we are all together in the same boat. We all depend from one another. According to the Gaston Institute, if you haven't heard of the Gaston Institute and you're interested in Hispanic data, I would check it out. Gaston, G-A-S-T-O-N, Gaston Institute, at UMass Boston. They stated, and I'm quoting, Boston's prosperity is tied, the city of Boston is tied to the growing Latino community and is critical for our shared future. Noting, very important, noting that 92%, 92% of the city's population growth since 1980, since 1980, that's a long time, since 1980, is due to that demographic. 92%. So what does it, all this data, what, you know, what does it really mean? Why, why should you get it? I mean, if you, if you own a business or you work for a company, you work for a nonprofit, it doesn't matter where you are. Well, it means that the society is not the same as before. Everything evolves. Everything is an, evol an evolution. And as such, we need to be aware that if you want to keep up with the times, like they say, if you want to be up to, up to speed, with what is happening in the economy, well, I think that you should kind of pay attention. At, at least you should pay attention. Let me give you 10 recommendations in order to engage, once again, understand, reach, and engage. Understand, reach, service, and engage with the population. First of all, is the Hispanic business opportunity for you, for you or your country, for government, for colleges, for telecommunications, for utilities, in the higher education field, in any field, does it make sense to kind of pay attention and see what you should do internally if anything at all. The chamber, Joe mentioned it, the chamber. Should that chamber be the same chamber as it was 30 years ago, 20 years ago? I've been a member, by the way, over 20 years. No, the chamber needs to evolve, and it is evolving, it is evolving. For the betterment of what? For the betterment of the economy for the betterment of the Merrimack Valley, for the betterment of Massachusetts, and so forth. So you need to dedicate resources. <coughs> you need to dedicate resources to see if this applies to you and your situation. Maybe it will, maybe it will not, but it's up to you to decide. You should do an internal assessment of your capabilities. And I was talking to Luz before, and Harry is my good friend, Harry Santiago, about what is happening internally now in your company, in your group, in your nonprofit. What is happening inside? What do you know about this market? What do you know? It's not only what you think you know, but it's what do you really know? Any organization, any nonprofit, any group 
should have a strategy. I think we all know that. That's kind of a given. Should you incorporate the Latino and ethnic sectors, Latino and ethnic sectors, within your corporate business strategy? That's what the real deal is. Should it be a set aside? Should it be if I have the money? Or maybe during Hispanic Heritage Month, like now, we do a breakfast, or we do some cultural presentations. We invite somebody with a guitar to be singing, or some mariachis to be playing and dancing. Is that, is that what Hispanic Heritage Month means? Is that the real intention? And let me tell you that it is not. That's not the intent. Because one of the stereotypes is that Latinos enjoy to dance. <laughs> Actually, I'm a salsa instructor. <laughs> <laughs> Men and women, I don't discriminate. Now, we're not going to dance together with the guys, but I can teach you. <laughs> so, consider providing. Even now, let me, let me tell you this. Even if you are Latino, do you know about Latino culture? Maybe if you're a Dominican, you, have, you know about Dominican culture. If you're from Peru, Peruvian culture. If you're Puerto Rico, Puerto Rican culture. But it doesn't mean that you know a whole lot about culture. Latino or no Latino culture. I mean, people with PhDs don't know everything that you need to know because culture is so wide, culture is so immense that nobody can tell you, oh, I know about Latino culture. You know something about Latino culture. Does any one of you that were born and raised here in Massachusetts or anywhere else, do you think that you know about the United States culture? You know something about the culture, right? I mean, really. So that's why I'm advocating that you consider providing cultural and professional development programs, cultural and professional development programs to empower your teams. Let me tell you, I travel, I travel a lot. And, and I love going to foreign countries, I do. Why, because there is that sense of anxiety now, I'm not, I'm not Armenian, uh, but that sort of anxiety that you are going to be facing the unknown. Because if you already know anything about a particular culture or country, then what you do? Why do you need to go? To see the Eiffel Tower, to go to Italy and Spain and Greece. And I've been to India, I've been, I've been to about 25 countries. You need to do what? to experience something different. Am I, am I correct? I mean, you know, if you want to go from here to a resort in the Caribbean, and you are you get transportation from the, from the airport to the resort, and then you're there, and you don't go anywhere else, and then you come back, Let's, for example, to the Dominican Republic. Have you experienced that country? Were you in the Dominican Republic? Yes. Have you sensed, have you experienced the Dominican culture? The response is no. You experience the, the resort culture, which are people to have fun and, and, and to enjoy themselves and everything else in a resort. So that is not learning about the culture. Be authentic in your communication. I mean, this is something that I see it every single day. Organizations, they have their, some of their employees that are not journalists, that are not copywriters, that may happen to know the language. But just because you happen to know English doesn't make you a writer. Does it make you a writer? Because you happen to know the language? I don't think so. There is such a thing as being a copywriter or being a journalist. So why in the Latino market, companies, some companies, I'm not saying all of them, 
why do they ask Maria Lopez or, or Jose Ibáñez or Pepe Santiago to translate something from English to Spanish? Now, if you really know about the field of communications, and I know a little bit about it, I was a, I created the first Spanish language radio program in this area, commercial radio program, and I was in a radio broadcaster for 35 years. Okay, now this is prior to La Mega, prior to Power 800. I started in the 70s. I don't want to tell you how old I am, but I'm 74. <laughs> <laughs> 74 and keep. <clears throat> be authentic, be authentic in your communication. Translations do not work. Now, I love Google to search. I don't love Google to translate. <laughs> would you would you create something about your brand? the essence of your brand through a web-based tool or platform? I'm hearing some, I'm seeing some faces, some heads that say no. So why should Latinos not get the same treatment, not get the same attention in communications, and they rather rely through Google Translate? Just think about it. Maybe companies want to save some money, but don't spoil your brand. Your brand is something that you don't toy around. You want to be authentic in any and all communications that you do. Provide a culturally welcoming work environment. I have had clients in my practice where you know, I meet, I meet with the owner, or I meet with the chief a human resource officer, and they, they say, Eduardo, we have a problem. We have new, quote unquote, new employees, let's say in the last 10 years. And they still sit with the same people, if they were still around the company, in the cafeteria. You know, Latinos are there, <coughs> and non-Latinos are somewhere else. And they don't participate, they don't do this, they don't do this, and they don't do that. And the quote unquote older in seniority, not age, seniority, the people that have been around for, for a long time in the company, they feel threatened. They feel that because they are not bilingual, and you are hiring bilingual people, that they're going to lose their jobs. I've heard that many, many, many times. You have also heard through the biased, biased media, and I don't want to get into politics, believe me, don't get me started on that. <laughs> the biased media, that Latinos and other ethnic immigrants, for those that have come recently, are taking the jobs away from the citizens of my country, the United States. Is, is that for real? Are you kidding me? I mean, there are 8.3 million, 8.3 million job openings as of last month in the US, 8.3 million. And there are 7.1 million people unemployed. Those are that are registered to work. So you would say, gee, we have 8.3 openings, 8.3 million, you have 7.1 million of people that are looking for work, then why don't they get employed? Well, the reason is that they're not qualified for the jobs that are, that are, that are open, for the jobs that are in demand. That's why we need, we as a society, need to recognize that people want to work. 99% of the people, I think, want to work. Now there is that 1%, maybe 2% that don't want to work. That's how life is. We also want to, and this is a controversial point, by the way, remunerate, pay more bilingual employees. Pay more bilingual employees. 
I don't know what, whether you agree or you disagree. But bilingual, bicultural people can deal with two sets of people, with the ones that speak English and the ones that speak Spanish. Should they be paid more? I'm saying, yes, pay them more. Why? Because they add more value. They are more value, they are more value to the equation. Okay? The same thing happens when a particular brand wants to expand internationally. So what are they looking for? They're looking for people that know that language and that know that culture. Why? Because you know that they want to be successful. They don't want to bring the U.S. policies and procedures of companies and embed them in Germany or embed them in France or embed them in any other country. You need to adapt and adopt. Adapt and adopt. Also have, have Hispanic representation and of any other ethnic group. If your geographic area of influence, if you are in an area where there are a good significant number of Haitians or Brazilians or people, Cambodia, in Lowell, or Latinos, or French, or Russians. You should have representation of those communities at all levels of the hierarchy. Not only cleaning floors, not only being messengers, but have them provide opportunities for growth. I didn't say give them. To give is one thing, to provide is another thing. To provide the opportunities that people need, that people want to get out, to get out in life. Remember at the very beginning that I said, why is the prosperity of Hispanics crucial, crucial to Massachusetts and the United States economy? A city like Lawrence with 82.3% of the population what would happen if all of a sudden Latinos say, you know what? I'm going back to Puerto Rico, I'm going to the Dominican Republic, close at the shops, sell homes, and I'll see you later. What would happen? What would happen to Massachusetts? I mean, really. And the US economy also, given the data that I present. <laughs> Include Hispanics and other ethnic groups, once again, in your corporate social responsibility programs. We work with some foundations, okay? some very well-known foundations. And these foundations, they want to know more about Latinos. They do. Most of them do. They want to know more about Latinos. Now, we all know about the major nonprofits in our communities. You know, the Boys Club, the YMCA, the YWCA, you know, we, we already know about the larger and larger. But let me tell you, there are over 65 nonprofits in North. Over 65. Some of them you never heard. And these are people at the trenches. These are people at the neighborhood level that are doing some wonderful things with the community, in general. I'm not talking about Latinos only. In general. And they need the technical expertise to apply for grants. They need guidance. So us, professionals, us, all of us, business people, people that are here to be successful, people that are here because you want a better future for yourself, or you want a better want to have a better future for your family. All of us have a social and moral responsibility to help, to contribute all to the betterment of all people. And that's kind of my message to you. That Latinos constitute a critical element of society and the economy. And in, and in that sense, I hope that through all through these presentations, and you can also party, 
during his planning heritage month. Doing salsa is good for you. <laughs> it is. It is. It's good for the brain, good for the soul, good for the legs. Now wear the right shoes. That's what I'm wearing these shoes. Because I'm going to dance salsa later. <laughs> but I really appreciate your time. If some of these points have been controversial, I think I made my point. <laughs> I made my point, because this was not to tell you how great Latinos are. I never said that we're great. We are just like everybody else. We have come here for a better future. And we are here to contribute to the well-being of society in general. So thank you very much. Oh, He's a very great, great friend of the Merrimack Valley Chamber, comes every year to speak to us, and you know he's a great person to talk to after the program as well. Ask any questions you might have. He's a great resource, and he just want to say thank you. He's a friend of the Chamber, but also to us as well. So on sure. behalf of the Merrimack Valley Chamber, we just want to present this to you. Do you have any, any questions at all? Any comments, questions, or are you still uh, asleep? <laughs> Anyone have a question? Questions or comments? Great presentation. Yes. yes. Oh, thank you. Thank Excellent you information. I, I didn't realize the percentage that was that high. Yeah, if, if any, by, by the way, if anybody wants, if anybody wants a bibliography, bibliography, bibliography of resources and data, let me know. You can connect with me. I'll, I'll be here. But you can connect with me. Uh, also, I can. Uh, you know, I'm not going to be charging you for any of this stuff. But we have plenty of data in healthcare, in education, in utilities, finance, you name it. I can share, I can, I can give you 20 to 30 minutes of my time to give you some advice if any of you are interested. You can also connect in LinkedIn. My name is Eduardo Crespo, I think uh, you already know. Connecting LinkedIn and, and you will be, you know, you know, you will have fun meeting some of your folks. Maybe not as outspoken as I am, because I'm very outspoken, as you can tell. But uh, you will, you will also learn from from a lot of other folks. So thank you very much again. I just want to thank Ed again for taking the time out of his schedule to speak this morning. He speaks to some major companies all throughout the United States, so it's very, we're very fortunate to have him here today. As Ed said, he's here to, today. If you have any questions, if you have any comments, uh, feel free to speak to him later this afternoon. So thank you, Ed. We appreciate it. Is that again, the expo starts, uh, well, if anyone's here, this, uh, I know if we have some exhibitors in the crowd, they can head next door after the breakfast. If anyone's not an exhibitor, feel free to walk through the expo, check out the people who are set up. You can stop, even though it starts to tell you early admission now.
at Seward. And then that Monday, October 7th, we're really excited. We have our annual Taste of the Merrimack Valley. It's the first annual event. We're really looking forward to it. It's right here at the Double Tree. There's time to register. The tickets are now on sale. If you know a restaurant that wants to promote their, uh, their, their, their items, you can have them sign up. It's free of charge to do so. So again, you can check out all the information at MerrimackValleyChamber.com. The last thing I want to mention is that on October, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, November 16th, we have our annual dinner. Uh, the governor is now the confirmed keynote speaker for that program, so we're looking forward to that. We'll be honoring some chamber members as well. Again, the governor will be here on November 16th, and now it's all taking place in April. So a number of programs taking place, you can find out more information on MerrimackValleyChamber.com. I want to thank the Double Street for having us, and for setting up an extra table for us as well. And with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to our chairman, Mike Sullivan. So welcome, Mike. Thank you, Mike. I am speaking on behalf of, because what's behind the scenes here for all these great events, I mean, that are going on, there's probably 10 events a week if you follow the Chamber website, but behind me, um, the great uh, executive director and his team is, is a phenomenal board of directors. There's uh, 30, 30 plus of us that meet all the time and try to give guidance to, to your chamber. And your chamber is, the, I think, the best in the state because of all of you, because of the exhibitors, because of the companies that belong to this chamber. And we have a few of our prestigious board people in the in the um, audience. So if you could just stand up real quick and Trish. Thank you, Trish. Come on, Maureen, stand up. And how about we, let's find you a plot for your board of directors and volunteers their time and really makes this chamber well. So with that being said, Madam Secretary, and, and to this great panel, we, we appreciate you being here. Um, you're going to get some great insight and advice, I'm sure. Wisdom, a lot more than you'll get from this fella here. That, that's good. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Joe Babalacqua, President of the Chamber. All right, so I want to be good because the chairman's here and members of our executive committee are here and all of you. And um, the chairman is absolutely correct. This is the best chamber of commerce. We have the most aligned chamber of commerce. We have the most effective. We have definitely the most active with over 110 programs a year. So whether it be women in business, we just held our women in business conference with a large drive. Our congresswoman and a great panel. Whether it be our young people in business, called Next Generation Leaders Program, getting people ready for the next phase of uh, business opportunity in the business, whether it be a nonprofit, HR, whether it be uh, not one or two expos, whether it be a regular development conference that we held this year with the Secretary of Economic Development, whether it be energy, because we have an award-winning energy program to uh, eat federally paid use of water merit and all because of our energy program. Whether it be we have the Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs, whether it be the work that we do with education, workforce development, and more, we will talk to you about in a moment. Uh, whether it be uh, the Government Affairs Program, which is the most successful, we work together, we bring business and government together, and we keep the season off every January with the mayors and the town managers and the governor. Then we do the members of Congress, the state senators, we have the Ways and Means uh, Chairman for the House of Representatives along with the state reps this year. And there's more coming, as Michael mentioned, the governor will be here at the end of the There's a whole host of more programs, something brand new, we keep adding programs, is the Taste of the Merrimack Valley, which we're experimenting with. It's going to be great. Uh, this is just the first year. But the Chamber is here to bring business together. And one of the issues that's very, very important to us is the issue of having people be ready for the jobs that they look for. Not just simply a job, but a career in their choice. So we actually did a great program a couple months ago with the superintendent of William Tech, Maureen, which was also is chairperson of the Chamber's Education Workforce Development Committee. And she brought with her the superintendent of Green Alarmist Tech. We did it not in a hotel or a restaurant, we did it in a place of business, in an industrial, a brand new high-tech industrial manufacturing facility. Because we wanted people to see that not everyone was destined for college, some were destined for location positions. It was an absolutely spectacular program, part of our education and workforce development program. And Whittier is the leader, as it is during the learning. So we want to introduce Superintendent Mario Lynch, who's the chairperson of our education workforce development committee. And she'll introduce, she's really a longtime friend, our special secretary. We look forward to seeing you. 
Secretary Jones of the Superintendent Tommy Lynch. Thank you, that was quite an introduction. Um, you know, this is my language for our course development. We have 24 career technical education programs every year. Um, we are about just under 1,300 state students, but I think we're also working at night with over 400 adult education students, particularly in the area of journeyman programs and plumbing and electrical, but as well as some enrichment type of programs. And then in the summer, we have what's known as the Career Technical Initiative, and this is really from the state um, sponsored program that we bring in nine programs this year, over 100 students, unemployed, underemployed adults. So we're working day, night, summers to provide that workforce that we know is so needed um, in our region. So when your tech encompasses 11 cities and towns, uh, three cities, eight towns, and um, we work, again, working day and night to provide that workforce for our region. But I'm really here to introduce. So it's my pleasure to introduce Lauren Jones, the Secretary of Labor and Workforce Development for the Commonwealth. The Executive Office of Labor and Workforce Development has three standard strategies. Cultivating a skilled workforce for a range of industries throughout Massachusetts, supporting economic stability for impacted workers following a job loss, injury, or illness, and protecting the rights, health, and safety, wages, and working conditions of our workers. Secretary Jones was a master's degree in public administration from Northeastern University and a bachelor's degree in political science from Providence College. She lives in Boston, and we really want to welcome you to the Maryland Valley Chamber. Secretary Jones. Good afternoon. Thank you, Maureen, and certainly thank you to the Chamber for having me today. Uh, thank you, Joe, for the invitation. I know sometimes in one's career you may find these full circle moments, and as I come here for an event with the Merrimack Valley Chamber of Commerce, I think back to my very first time being in this region, um, and I can recall it was my first week in state government during Governor Patrick's first year in office. At the time, I was working in the Massachusetts Office of Business Development, and as part of my introduction to the agency in my very first week, I spent the day with Peter Milano, who many of you probably know from over the years, and we visited the Riverwalk development, which featured my first ever slice of Sal's pizza, courtesy of Sal himself. And of course, it was my very first time meeting Joe Bevilacqua as well. So um, I appreciate the opportunity, and Joe's been trying to get me to come here uh, to the region for some time. So I'm so glad that I'm able to be here, and also for a topic that is top of mind uh, for all of you. Uh, throughout my career, I have found a common denominator in a lot of what I've been able to do at the intersection of workforce development and economic development, and that is working directly with employers, small businesses, mid-sized businesses, large employers, labor, and making sure that we understand, and I understand, what's top of mind so often that has been and continues to be talent. Um, and I certainly know that it's a top priority for the chamber, and clearly with a panel that we'll have today demonstrating the commitment to ensuring members are receiving the resources that you need. Um, as we think about where we are in Massachusetts today, our labor market participation has returned to pre-pandemic levels. Yet at the same time, we know there are more than 230,000 jobs open in Massachusetts, and only two to one of skilled talent for every opening. And this leads to the challenges that I know you face each and every day. But I also want to make sure that you know Governor Healy, Lieutenant Governor Driscoll, and our entire administration are committed to strengthening the state's competitiveness so that we remain a commonwealth that not only attracts and retains talent, but also develops diverse talent and provides intentionality behind investing in meaningful careers that will lift up the workforce that you need, deliver good wages and benefits, and really making sure that individuals and their families are able to achieve economic mobility. And to achieve this, we know that workforce development hinges on collaboration. That includes teaming up with folks in government, employers, training providers, academia, nonprofits, and so many more. And I know the Chamber plays a key role in this. I also appreciate our partnership with 
mass hire uh, to make these connections. And at the local level, you have Frank Bennett, who is going to be part of today's panel, uh, really spearheading that, and then mass hire Merrimack Valley Regional Workforce Board. Um, we also know that as we look at tackling workforce development, workforce challenges, there's not one single solution that's going to solve your needs. Um, but we know that there can be a common theme that can be at the heart of a workforce agenda. And I really truly think that at the heart of that agenda is our people. Ultimately, it's the talent. It's the individuals who comprise your businesses today. It's the individuals that are studying in our schools, in our job training programs, in our technical schools, in our technical programs, and really that untapped talent, that next generation of talent that we want to invest in to make sure that they get their next shot and that opportunity right here in Massachusetts. So building on all of that, earlier this year, the Healy Driscoll administration released our first state workforce agenda. Um, this is really our vision to strategically grow the workforce that we need today, as well as over the next five to 10 years. What may have been the way of doing business, the way of supporting workforce five years ago is not necessarily gonna be the solution today, nor um, as we think innovatively for the future. But we have to have a world-class uh, workforce system to support the world-class workforce that we know we have and that we want to retain. The good news, though, is this agenda, while we released it in the spring, is not just a report that sits on the shelf. We are actively ensuring that this workforce agenda serves as a blueprint and a playbook to make sure that we are tackling talent attraction and retention, talent development, thinking about how we, as an employer ourselves, the Commonwealth, can look inward and lead by example, and then also thinking about how we can build up that world-class workforce system, thinking about the infrastructure that helps to connect job seekers and employers. And so one of the things that we have done um, is to make sure that that reflects the local communities. So first, our workforce agenda underscores that very importance of what happens in the region, what happens here in Merrimack Valley. And our workforce skills cabinet has been working with the Mass Hire Merrimack Valley along with partners throughout the Northeast region to make sure that we hear directly from you to deliver the next iteration that we have as a regional blueprint. Um, the regional blueprint really maps out how you can work collaboratively across all different entities, not just with the business community, but partnering with vocational technical schools like Whittier Tech, engaging with job training providers, making sure that the industries and the job openings that you have today that you're projecting for the future, like in advanced manufacturing and healthcare, you're training for the skills that are needed and ensuring that you hear directly from industry to, to close the skills gaps that may exist among that untapped talent and provide that pathway. If you just look at um, institutions like Lawrence General, they're posting over or nearly 120 jobs on a monthly basis, and we need to make sure that we're closing those skills gaps. Um, and so we are making sure we're doing exactly that, but it can be very informative in this kind of blueprint, if you will, this regional blueprint serves as a huge uh, roadmap to do uh, a lot of what we think um, can unlock opportunities. And I'll speak to a few of the uh, tools in our toolbox that will help to unlock these opportunities. Uh, first, we have our registered apprenticeship program, what I like to call it a tool in our toolbox that we want to make sure it can become a tool for you, for employers right here in the region. I think um, you may know of registered apprenticeship as you think about your electrician, your carpenter, um, long-standing occupations that have used a combination of technical training, on-the-job training to gain the competencies that we know are so critical when you think about such a roles in, in the building trades. But we also know that this model can unlock meaningful and well-paying positions in the other industries. Again, advanced manufacturing as a great example, healthcare and human services, the life sciences, early childhood education. These are all examples that we see happening when you think about registered apprenticeship right here in this region. Um, unique to this region is the Northeast Advanced Manufacturing Collaborative, and they actually serve as an intermediary, helping many within manufacturing stand up 
a registered apprenticeship program, and we want to see more local businesses from this region tapping this benefit um, and this resource. In fact, I actually saw that the Northeast Advanced Manufacturing Collaborative is helping other companies outside of this region. So even more of a reason for rallying behind this opportunity and making sure local businesses can lean on this opportunity to, again, combine technical and on-the-job training for workers that you're going to hire directly. You're investing in your own talent through this learn and earn model, and it can unlock more opportunities. Additionally, we're investing in workforce development programs that require job training organizations to collaborate with employers, ensuring that companies are part of the equation for what we're investing in. Understanding, again, the skills that the job seekers are gaining will immediately benefit you as the employer. These include grant programs in partnership with Commonwealth Corporation, like the Workforce Competitiveness Trust Fund, or the Workforce Training Fund, and the Career Technical in Initiative that helps to team up with our vocational technical schools. Through the Workforce Competitive Trust Fund, as an example, we invested earlier this year $16.3 million to nine or regional organizations that are upskilling 1,800 plus individuals in careers for behavioral health and healthcare roles across the state, including in this region. By partnering with Lawrence General and Greater Lawrence Family Health Clinics, as an example, we're standing up roles like CNAs and medical assistants, good paying opportunities that we know are so needed to stand up and sustain our healthcare um, industry. We're also teaming up with vocational schools, and we think about opportunities that we also know are in demand, like welding and, and carpentry and CNC machining. We also have awarded $10.9 million in workforce training funds that are helping businesses statewide retrain your existing workers. This just goes to show how important it is not only to attract new talent, but to make sure that you're upskilling and retaining your existing talent. And the great thing about the Workforce Training Fund, it allows you to become more productive. You're investing in your existing workforce and making sure they have the skills so that you can continue to be competitive yourself. And that can be from ESOL to industry-recognized credentials that will boost your needs within your workforce. Um, year to date, we've been able to train or we're projecting to train over 6,000 workers in the workplace. And also, by doing so, companies are going to be able to hire new talent. And that projection is um, over 1,400 new workers that will come into play over the life cycle of these workforce training grants. We want to make sure that these tools, again, are becoming resources for you right here in this region. Um, and that is why the Hillary Driscoll administration um, continues to think about how can we not only ensure that you have access to these opportunities, but also we're, as we stand up opportunities to attract that talent, addressing the barriers that we know also exist. Um, we can stand up as many programs as we want, but in order to unlock true opportunities, we have to recognize that there's persistent barriers to employment. And we are making sure that we are intentional in how we can connect more people to job training programs, but also sustain their experience and their outcomes through job training programs, which is exactly why last week we launched the Workforce Skills Fund, a stipend program designed to provide financial support for eligible participants going through these very programs, the Workforce Competitiveness Trust Fund and the Career Technical Initiative. We know that to jump back into the labor market is something we need more individuals to do. They have still these barriers that exist. Think childcare, access to transportation, housing stability. And we want to make sure that we can lift up opportunities for them to be part of our, our workforce. We know that we have to do our part as well. So we are leveraging some, some ARPA dollars to stand this up as a pilot. We look forward to making sure this paves more opportunities for people across the state, including in this region, and ultimately gain the employment that we know employers are looking for right here. So now I just highlighted a bunch of tools in the toolbox, um, and certainly there's plenty more, but I want to make sure that you can walk away accessing these. So just by a show of hands, how many here are already connected to the Mass Hire Regional Workforce Board, your career center here in this region, whether it's the Merrimack Valley or if you're in the Lowell area, the Merrimack, uh, the Mass Hire Lowell, just by a show of hands. Okay, so only about a, maybe a third of the room is that, so this is a great opportunity, a nice plug.
plug for Frank at the end of the table. Please stay connected with him. You'll hear him during today's panel. Please walk away knowing that he can be a resource for you um, as we think about accessing these tools. Mass Hire serves as that local connection for job seekers to find all these opportunities that we're investing in, for employers to connect to that skill talent, and to be part of these collaborative uh, job training programs that we provide. I also want to take a moment to thank any member in this business community who has been part of our efforts to hire migrants that are living in our shelter, knowing that we have thousands of individuals that are gaining work authorization ready to work. Um, as we think back on the past year, we transitioned into 2020, from 2023 into the new year, following months of hard work in advancing work authorization. Nearly 3,000 individuals gained work authorization but were living in our shelters. We wanted to make sure that they could find opportunities for work right here. Again, we continue to engage with employment services, recognizing there are barriers that will exist for individuals to pursue opportunities right here and to lift up uh, those opportunities. And we know um, how closely tied English language proficiency and occupational training is to employment success. To support these critical connections, we're focusing on in-demand and high-growth sectors such as manufacturing, healthcare, and human services, with ESOL as a foundational component to all training activities. And to date, thanks to partnerships with organizations like Mass Hire and leadership from my office, including Assistant Secretary Ken Brown, we've been able to have 2,800 work authorized migrants who have been in emergency assistance at some point secure employment right here in Massachusetts. 1,200 individuals have also enrolled in ESOL training. For individuals residing in shelter, we know gaining employment is key to their transition and securing housing stability. So building on all of this work we have been doing, I'm pleased to announce today that the Healy Driscoll Administration is offering two grant opportunities totaling $4.25 million to provide work supports, training, job placement, and more for individuals currently residing in or eligible to reside in emergency assistance shelters. Please join me in another applause. Certainly thank you to folks in this region who have been teaming up with us to help support more opportunities, Mass Hire in particular. And we continue to work, work with all of our partners to deliver greater outcomes for job placement for everyone looking for a job, who wants a job, to look for a job right here and to find those opportunities um, in this region. So I'll close with just a, a few uh, uh, reminders or things that are on the horizon. As I heard from Mike of Alakma, I don't think this would be a chamber event that are coming up, right? Four, coming. <laughs> uh, so uh, thank you to anyone that's been plugged in in this region as we've been tackling early childhood education. We have awesome listening sessions in July and August. I have the opportunity of co-chairing a task force alongside Secretary Tutwiler of Education and Secretary Howe of Economic Development. Knowing how much of a priority it is to Governor Healy and Lieutenant Governor Driscoll to make sure that we provide a more accessible and affordable child care system. Before uh, the end of the year, we plan to present recommendations reflecting the feedback that we've heard um, to the governor, uh, and, and that will help to shape where we go forward, especially as we think about workforce development, knowing how childcare is an infrastructure that's so critical to accessing a job. We also know that caregiving uh, extends not just from our littlest learners, but also to senior care. In May, my office stood up the Mass uh, Caregivers Coalition, bringing a workforce focus to caregiving and working with business, labor, and partners to raise awareness of existing resources um, to make sure that workers can access as well as employers can access for caregiving in a workplace. And we'll be hosting an event um, during National Caregivers Month in November, on November 7th, to convene partners and employers alike uh, to help lift up the message around caregiving. You can learn more by visiting mass.gov forward slash caregiver coalition for more information. And 
the last thing I'll plug is um, we are always thinking about how we as a commonwealth can lead by example. And from a workforce perspective, we recognize how important it is to lift up skills-based hiring because it expands opportunities to attract and retain and develop even more talent. People that may have the skills, knowledge, and ability, but not necessarily a degree um, that reflects their skills. So earlier this year, Governor Healy signed an executive order to institute skills-based hiring within our own um, policy as an employer, tapping into our 40,000 plus workforce. But we're also using this as a huge opportunity to engage with employers, um, recognizing companies who have long been at a skills-based hiring strategy, but also introducing it to the curious, those that are just learning about it now and figuring out how they can leverage best practices from other employers to do the same. And we will be convening through the Mass Skills Coalition a kickoff summit on October 30th geared towards employers so that you can connect with peers and learn from each other and find ways to institute that skills-based or skills-first strategy to unlock opportunities for people that can be part of your workforce. And you can learn more about that by visiting mass.gov forward slash mass skills, and that's with three S's in the middle, to learn more about this important work. Um, I'll just end with how I started. Um, in order for us to lift up our workforce, we really have to think about people and people first. And recognizing that helps to unlock more and more opportunities for meaningful careers, uh, more and more opportunities for good wages and benefits, and certainly meeting the needs of employers across every industry and businesses large and small. And we at the Healy School Administration love to be a partner with you to make that a reality in this region and appreciate the partnership with the Merrimack Valley Chamber of Commerce um, in doing so. We look forward to more great work ahead. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to take um, some questions after. I just want to make a couple, a couple quick comments. Um, the um, secretary was absolutely fantastic. I think uh, you're seeing that. But I see her in more, even more in-depth discussions uh, at Devon's when she, she head, headlines the uh, World Statewide Workforce Development Conference. And if you want to hear more details, you want to learn more, she's absolutely fantastic. I want to tell you about a couple things we are doing that you may not be aware of. We actually partner with uh, Frank Gourmet and Mass Hire for several programs, one of which is um, employing youth. We think that's really important to the leadership of our chairman and our members of the board of directors. You know, we're part of the uh, youth program. And at the same time, we're one of the few chambers in the country where we're told that actually partners with the union. We partner with the Merrimack Valley Central Labor Council on a number of initiatives, and uh, workforce development is obviously very, very important in the apprenticeship program. So that's another initiative that our chamber is uh, very proud of being associated with. But let me say thank you uh, to the secretary. We're going to take questions afterwards. But I'd like to introduce um, um, the next speaker, is Louise Frazier. She's the founder and CEO of Lead Through Mind, and she's also one of my sponsors. I took her out of order because I think it's important to learn about some initiatives that she's involved in. And she just hosted the most amazing program um, about two weeks ago. A few weeks ago. I'm telling you, I thought I was in a disco. Uh -huh. She had everybody jumping and jiving and diving, and it was amazing what she did. But she got people motivated about helping one another and looking forward. So please welcome Lucy. so much, Joan and Mike, for having me here today, Secretary of Labor, Lauren Jones, and uh, of course, Workforce Development, thank you for your words. Uh, they really penetrated because every day, those of us who are in business, which we all are, those of us who are in leadership, which many are, those of us who contribute to work, which means all of us have something to do with what is happening in our world relative to workforce development. And so let me share this saying, what got you here won't get you there. How many of you have heard that saying? What got you here won't get you there. 
right? So Marsha Goldman is a leadership expert and works with top 100 companies as a coach and a leadership expert talking about what is needed in order for organizations to grow. So what I want to bring to this conversation is the perspective of business leaders. So if you're a business owner or you're a business leader, what can you expect to happen over the next three to five years? I have spent the last 30 years as an HR executive working with business leaders side by side, CEOs, their C-suite, all levels of organizations at a corporate level, at a nonprofit level, all the way to global experiences. And I can tell you that there's one thing for sure that is lacking in all areas within workforce, and that is that the workforce really wants to be seen as a human being. So to your point, people first. And when we focus on people first, they give back more. Right, there's loyalty, talk about attraction and retention. People want to work for the best organizations, people want to stay with the best organizations. So when we think about what is happening within the workforce over the next five years, we can consider this evolution. Who knows, how long ago did the World Wide Web start? When did it become public? Anybody know? Think, 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 think. I think we all probably experienced it, at least most of us. It's been 30 years. Now, I don't really consider 30 years that long ago. So think about where we were 30 years ago. For some of us, it'll be easier than others. <laughs> For me, it's quite easy, because I remember exactly what happened. I was very young in my career, early career, and I remember this whole concept of working in customer service when I first started, that was my job, and having to learn how to navigate emails, and how to navigate this thing that was called the world, you know, WWW, and do research, and then Google popped up. I think you can remember that evolution. So the point of this is that lots of things have changed. And we can't stop technology or the things that are happening within our society from changing. What people need will continue to evolve, and so do our practices in business. So that means that you, the business owner, needs to be able to keep up with the skill development that's needed to be side and side, like parallel tracking with all the changes happening around the world. You follow me? You with me? Right, so let me share with you five things that I consider to be really important and that really are connected to what you were talking about, uh, Lauren, and that is, the first thing is no surprise, since the pandemic, didn't everything change? in terms of how we worked. I remember the days, this is like four or five years ago, where barely anybody was working from home. You had to have special permission to be working from home. I get the head nods over there, yes, right? That was a big deal. You're gonna work from home only if I trust you, only if you check in often, only, only, only. Today, the majority of our workforce is insisting they have more control today than they've ever had, meaning we, employees, have a voice, and employers, you the business leaders, the business owners, have had to, whoa, okay, let me listen, let me, let me understand what's happening, because if you don't stop to listen and seek to understand, what's the consequence? Bye, 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 bye. <laughs> and a lot of that was happening. You remember during the pandemic, people were leaving jobs left and right, jumping from one thing to another. What were they looking for? remote work, and flexible work arrangements. Flexible work arrangements. So if you can't do remote work because it's essential for your employees to be in the office, they want flexible work arrangements. Why is that? Because the world is changing. Everything's too fast, too many things, right? Too many responsibilities, right? So many things are changing. So that's the first one. Remote and flexible work arrangements pay close attention. That will continue to evolve. We will never be back to where we started four years ago. That's gonna completely change. In fact, we can talk about it from the perspective of so much so that employee well-being and mental health now has been at the center of many of the organizational conversations that are happening because people are bringing their whole selves into the workplace. 
Are we not talking about things so much more differently today in the workplace than we ever had? Now we're talking about all sorts of things. You know what they are. Right, so when I think about my friend Stephanie, who is in uh, benefits, your benefits, your employee benefits are shifting because we need more things like mental health care. I'm an executive coach, I spend a lot of time with the C-suite, with all levels of organizations, individual contributors, I get hired. Most of the time they say to me, can you come and help me fix something? And so what's the issue? What's happening? I, I have a ter toxic work environment. I have people that don't get along. I have people that won't talk to each other. I have people that are working in silos. Do you all understand? You, you all can relate to that? Can you help me fix that? So now I go into coaching and training, and what are, what are people actually saying? They're saying that I don't, I'm not seen. I'm not heard. We're gonna talk about diversity, inclusion, and belonging in a minute. I don't feel like I belong. I've got too many pressures at home. Back in the day, for those of you who can relate to this, we were trained, I remember my training early days. When you come to the office, when you come into the building, pretend there's a hook and leave your life there. Leave your personal life there and walk in and do your job. Your job is your job and your home life is your home life. That is no longer the case. And so the reason why I created and founded the Lead Humano Collective, Lead Humano and Yo Soy Latina, so it's Lead Human. The one thing that I find that is missing when I'm talking to employers about what is, what is really happening, what's the pain point? What are you trying to solve for? When you peel back the onion and get to the core, it's people. So people, well-being and mental health is important, skills development. Not for just what you need today, but what you need in the future state. How many of you have heard of AI? AI, raise your hand. Who's scared to death of AI? AI, what the heck? <laughs> what is going to happen? I guarantee you in the next three years, it's already happening today, your job descriptions are going to have to change. Why? Because you're going to, you're going to be pushed into creating new ways of working using this technology, just like we did with email and www, the World Wide Web. Right? All of this is starting to shift. So build your skill sets for your workforce today, but with an intention of developing them for the future state. That's how you will keep your business relevant. And, not, and, and this disruption is going to take your business if you're not able to move at the same level. Same track, same pace. Make sense? Yeah. Two more. The gig economy. Let's talk about that for a second. How many of you know what a gig economy is? Yes, what is it? Somebody shout it out. What is the gig economy? Don't be shy. Let me give you this example. Pandemic. People started to shift and find different jobs because they wanted to work remote, they need flexible work environment. More and more, have you not noticed people are like working independently as entrepreneurs? I have a skill, I have a talent, I have a specialization. I'm gonna work for myself. So you're going to see a lot more freelancers and you're gonna see a lot more entrepreneurs, like myself, who said, I can stay in an organization and do this, but why not develop leaders and why not coach leaders, why not work with business leaders to maximize and optimize their people, and so that's my job now. That's the leading one collective, that's what I do. So I stepped away in order to create my own thing, and many more people are looking to do that. You will find over the next five years that organizations are gonna start shifting from a payroll of employee expenses to a payroll of contracted freelance expenses. It's going to shift, it's already starting to happen. And lastly, diversity, equity, and inclusion will continue to be front and center. Front and center. We need to continue to focus on our people in terms of who they are, authentic, their authentic um, uh, presence in our organization, who they are, what they represent, is gonna be really important because that's one of the ways that you retain them. It's no longer about inclusion and making sure that they're there, it's about belonging. Do they feel that they're a part of something bigger than themselves? So those are the five areas, and to do my shameless plug, because everybody else has been doing it, <laughs> I, uh, I have been in my role as founder and CEO of the Lead Model Collective for two years. 
I have recently uh, signed the lease. That was the biggest step I've ever done for five years with my own training and coaching space institute in North Andover. I'm very proud and excited for that. I have leadership development programs, coaching programs, group coaching, and so on. So there is a lot that's happening in my world to help support this, particularly as, as someone who was born in Lawrence, Massachusetts, as a Latina, to give back to my community. And um, I really appreciate this opportunity, Joe, to be here. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Stephanie Messina Sinwich, who is the Executive Vice President and partner of Luke Jackson, a member of our Chamber Board of Directors. Good afternoon, Joe Mike. I want to say thank you for inviting me to the other board chair people. Um, welcome. Um, as Joe said, I am the partner um, of a benefits practice of Blue Jackson Benefits HR Solutions, which is in North Andover, Providence, Rhode Island, and Brockton, Mass. So we see a lot of employers, we see what they're doing for their workforces and how they're building their workforce. And one of the things, um, I took a different little perspective today when it comes to uh, workforce development. It's really talking about what are you giving your employees, what, are you, what is going to keep those employees in your buildings, um, and what are they looking for. So right now, um, one of the biggest things that I focus on when I go into a company is I'll look at the company and I'll say, how many generations do you have? How many generations are out there right now? Does anyone have an answer? So the older workforce is staying longer, and we got the, tw the 20 year olds coming in behind us. Does a 20 year old want the same thing as a 60 year old? I don't think so. And a lot of times there's a big disconnect. So we want to lower our turnover rate. We want to improve our productivity. We want to gain um, very active and problem solving employees. But as Lou's already said, they have to be engaged. How do you get them? How do you keep them? The keeping is the hard part, and do you know what you're working with? A lot of companies I go into do not know their workforce. So I always go in and I say, have you surveyed them? Do they really want those free movie tickets? Or do they want the better health benefits? A lot of companies I go into today don't offer vision insurance. And I look at them like, this is a no-brainer. Vision insurance is low-hanging fruit. But if you don't know what they want, how do you keep them? How do you attract and retain them? So one of the biggest things I always say is employees want to belong regardless of age. So whether you're younger or older, you want to be an asset to a company. You want to make sure that they feel that they're part of your culture. And one of the things um, we see today beyond just common benefits is culture. Like Lou said, there's a lot of diversity and inclusion out there, but are they really connected with who you are? Monster right now just came out with a survey. 68% of all employees will not look for another job if they connect with your culture. Do you know what your culture is? Are you that hardworking, you leave, as Lou said, your job at the door, you come in, and you don't talk about anything all day. And if, God forbid, you get a phone call that you can't sit, you, you're basically having a heart attack at your desk. How do I get out of here? Is the, is the employer going to understand that I have to go home? You have an elderly parent. 40 years ago, people didn't talk about elderly parents and benefits. They talked about childcare, and even now more childcare. But, you know, I walk through the next door, and I'm looking at all the tables, and I'm saying, 50% of these have to do with the elderly, and how to take care of them. That wasn't an issue. But now it, it has become an issue, and it's very important that you understand it as an employer to keep your best talent in your house. So, I took the word team. Because that's what happens at the end, is a team approach. So the T is for total rewards. Keep in mind, six generations. Employers need to look at their employees because they're going to look at you for positive reinforcement. Have you talked to them lately? Have you had a lunch and learn? Did you do a survey? 
Uh, sometimes when I go into companies as a broker, so do you know what they want? No idea. I mean, something as small as a pizza party once a month will help your employees mentally because they want to know that you are happy with them and they belong to you. Every day is the E. Every day you have to reinforce your benefits. I see this every time, your culture. You go into a company, oh, they only talk to me once a year. They don't talk to me other than that. The only time I go to human resources is if I have a massive problem and I'm being called in for something wrong, I do. It's not gonna work. They don't leave, they don't walk out that door. You have to I also understand that not, as, not everyone, depending upon what level of the workforce you're in, has the internet. I mean, some employers, I go and I say to them, how are you going to communicate that you like them, or you want them to be better? And they look at me and they go, oh, there's about 10 of them that don't have the internet, they don't know how to go online. So you have to get creative. You have the lunch and learn. You have the broker come in and do a demonstration or a job, a, a, a wellness fair. And that's another thing. One of the biggest benefits I see growing is they're asking for a wellness benefit. People want to get their flu shot at work. The next thing is the A. All of you, we're young and we're old. All of you belong to that team. So you have to meet everyone at some point for them to connect with you. Whether it be the flu shot, whether it be the pizza party, whether it be the flexible work schedule, as Lou said. You have to connect with them in order for them to stay with you. So it's more than just workforce development, it's great to get them in the door, but how do you keep them? That's the biggest thing. A young person is gonna look for a flexible work schedule, or if they're having children, good health insurance. They're also looking right now for time off. To the younger person, I'll be honest with you, they're looking at flexible work schedule. How are they gonna, you know, are they gonna understand if I want, you know, work from home two days? And I hate to say this, but the older generation has caught on. The older person is now saying to the younger generation, they have it better than I do. So they're catching on, they want the flexible work schedules. And then the last one is manage for the M. Strategy is not haphazard. It's not about, I'm, not, I'm just gonna have my one year benefit fair, and that's it. You have to consistently keep telling them, it's important that you belong to my team. It's important that you come to work every day. I actually like having you here. And you know, benefits that I look at now compared to when I was a benefits executive at a large corporation in the Merrimack Valley, it, it's not the same. People want to make sure that they are heard and that you recognize that they are valuable to your company. So in conclusion, um, build a team approach. Talk to them. Let them talk to you. Make sure that you understand every employee is different. Or well, not all numbers. Joe's pulling me off, I can tell. <laughs> Look at your culture. Make sure you give them the tools. What? You said in conclusion. <laughs> He always likes to pick up. Okay, every employee is different. Make sure that you understand that. Look at your culture. Make sure they connect with your culture. People are not robots. Remember that. They are programmed. They don't come to work because they want only the salary. They want much more. And it's a different world today. I'm done, Joe. <laughs> in Chicago or everywhere else. But we have the best speakers right here. The secretary wants to apologize. She had to go to another program meeting and obviously uh, reworded that she wasn't able to say what she said. Thank you. Our next speaker is someone that you have to know. The chamber is absolutely connected to his organization. It's the Mass High Merrimack Valley Workforce Investment Board. All the programs that the secretary spoke about run through his office one way, shape, or manner. And uh, we're very proud of that we serve on the board of directors. 
uh, Michael, when he was, sorry, Chairman Sullivan, when he was mayor, was the chairman of the board. And I want to introduce Frank Bonet, who was a master of helping companies with business opportunities in terms of existing state grant and aid programs. So, Mr. Bonet. Uh, currently, we engage in several noteworthy partnerships, including 
kind of collaboration with uh, Helfrich Brothers, where incorporation, um, momentum manufacturing, and the Northeast Advanced Manufacturing Consortium, which is a board member on there. Um, and we are uh, working on our first year, I think the second year, ESOL manufacturing. So we provide training on manufacturing but in two languages or in one language. And by the end of the training, the individual has already learned the basic lingos and words necessary to work in manufacturing of any type of uh, and, and that's training them on machines and, and all sorts of things, right? And so uh, we also have, I think this is our second year. We're working on our second year trying to fill uh, slots up in our healthcare hub continuation grants. And I think it's our first year in our behavior grants. As you know, we had a good scare there with, uh, with the Holy Family thing, with the Stewart uh, Hospital. We weren't sure if we would were, we were have to take care of thousands of laid off health uh, care employees throughout the area, but uh, the team with the governor and secretary came through with uh, our you know, elected congregation down at the, at the, at the federal level. Um, so uh, we work with Greater Mars uh, Health Unit, Mars General, and we're this week calling few tens to 20 behavior centers in the area to see if they need help placing individuals in entry level positions in the behavior. And we know we have we have recovery centers all throughout uh, this region that are in desperate need for counselors and entry level individuals. And so we train and then we place them to work there. Um, we are collaborating now with uh, collaborating forever uh, with uh, Lair across multiple industries. Uh, we collaborate with uh, Green Mars Technical on the WCTF and CTI funds that the Secretary had mentioned, uh, and also with Northern Essex Community College to offer courses in high demand fields that require certification or license. And even simple ones as well. We collaborate with uh, NETS, New England Training Tractor. And we pay them eight to nine thousand dollars per head. We pay them, they train an individual, they get their CDL, well, they get the training, and then they, they, they take them to take their test and ensure that they're gonna pass. And then we place them to work in, you know, Merrimack Valley Transportation Authorities, school buses, or tractor trailers across uh, across the country. And they, and they, they, well, the taxpayers pay for it really because that's funds from the federal government and the state, but it's free to employers. Employers in the area don't have to pay. Uh, we have uh, job fairs that we do both uh, virtually and, um, and you know, in person. Uh, it gives you an opportunity to instantly interview individuals that come prepared already through the Career Center, their members and clients. Um, we have industry specific in Georgia. We, uh, we, we recently completed a regional blueprint that has been shared with Merrimack Valley officials, representative partners and board members. And that, that blueprint is a 30 page you know, document, a plan of what the area is going to do about workforce development or things that are in barriers like transportation, child care, and things like that. You can find that at Mass Hire NV, like Merrimack Valley, WVWorkforceWork.org. I have a card, I can leave my card here. Um, but the, the biggest thing that I wanted to talk about was uh, the labor market in the Merrimack Valley, right? So um, while we distribute information to, um, to our partners and any, anyone else who wants to, to, to know about statistics and data of the Merrimack Valley, um, a lot of people don't know what we currently have. So our regional blueprint that just was uh, completed about a few months ago, uh, states that the Merrimack Valley makes up 32% of jobs in the Northeast. And that's those three regions, Greater Old, North Shore. 32%, so that's about a third. The biggest one is North Shore, and then Greater Old with the lower, because they have eight city towns. Uh, the largest industry sector in the Northeast is healthcare and social assistance, uh, which is also the largest in the state. The next largest industry in the region is retail trade, government, manufacturing, professional, scientific, and technical services. Those are your IT, cybersecurity, and, and I'm on. The top growing industry sectors based on both historic and projected growth include transportation and warehousing, real estate and rental and leasing, 
construction, professional, scientific, and technical services, health care, and social assistance, finance, and insurance, government, including public schools, and that's the biggest chunk of government, and a lot of teachers are needed, and then manufacturing. And uh, based on the industry data and our current qualitative data that we have on the original blueprint, the three most, uh, the three top industries in the Merrimack Valley that are most important right now, advanced manufacturing, healthcare, professional scientific. That's what we think uh, is important to the economic success of the region. The other ones coming close behind, clean energy and climate tech, education, and construction. And so we have, you know, we have a lot of data, a wealth of data. So if you need it, you can always call us, you can always email us, you can always go to our um, our website, the regional blueprint is there. But if you are looking for specific data on your industry, we will provide you a nice little booklet with certain pages that tells you the ups and downs of you trying to get into that industry. Um, the other one is that we uh, oversee the performance of the Career Center here in, uh, in, in Lawrence, and it used to be in one in Haverhill, now it's a part-time uh, because the foot traffic wasn't as heavy as the funds were expended to, you know, to rent locations. But they do have three days, two days or three days a week. They are available up in Haverhill. We're hoping that in the future we can get a mobile unit going through all of our Merrimack Valley so we can support and serve clients as well. Um, that's all I have, unless you have questions, and I'll be here for a little while if you want to talk more. But like I said, you know, we are here to serve businesses, uh, and we are here to serve our residents, job seekers. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for attending today. I want to thank all of our fantastic speakers today. Let's just give them a round of applause again. Let's give them a round of applause again. We'll see them at the end of the program. But thank you all for joining us. Just want to remind everyone the expo is still running. It'll be going until 3 p.m. So if you haven't checked it out yet, make sure to stop by next door. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the expo the mixer will uh, begin, begin at 3 p.m. And I just want to say thank you to our sponsor, Beacon Minor. Again. So thank you, everyone. Thank you.